Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to be here, to be in New Zealand. I have been in New Zealand before, only for a short period of time, and I was very happy to react positively to the request of end-of-life choices to come over here and give a presentation, or a, a number of presentations in your country. I have been traveling practically up north and going down completely to the south of, uh, of your beautiful country. And although I'm working, I enjoy the weather here. In February, my wife told me this morning that it is raining and freezing cold. So I said, OK, I'm sitting in the sunshine. I will try to get to finish my talk around uh, quarter to three, so you have time for an interval. And I think the Q&A afterwards is very important because I think it is really important for you to get, request, uh, get answers to the things you want to know. I want to start, Carol said, I used to be a family doctor. I want to start introducing to you my patient, Mrs. B. Mrs. B was a district nurse, so she was a professional. She was 51 years old when she died. And as I said, life, she had a good life, she had a good career, uh, but life had not been good for her. When she was 29, she developed a Hodgkin disease, which at that time, and I'm talking about the 60s, was a serious, difficult to treat disease. But she was cured. And if you think that was all, it's not true. Nine years later, she got a breast carcinoma, which also was treated successfully. And she thought, well, that was it, and she wanted to go on with her career as a nurse. But she was 49 when she presented at my office telling about she had some pain in her stomach and she wondered what it was. And we found out, I sent her to hospital for an examination, making picture x-rays and things like that. And they told her that she had an ovarian cancer and it was already spread. So it was very much impossible to treat her. Still, she thought, I have fought those other two, so I'm going to fight this one as well. So she started all the treatment with the specialists. Uh, and in the meantime, she visited me regularly, because that is what we do in the Netherlands. You refer your patient to the hospital for the specialist treatment. But certainly, as a family doctor, I liked to be involved in her process. And so I talked to her regularly. And one of those days, she raised the issue of euthanasia with me. 70s, halfway to 70s, which was still illegal in the Netherlands to perform euthanasia. But in the medical profession, we knew it was happening. Doctors were doing something like that. And she thought, I just asked him, what do you think of euthanasia? So we talked about it, and I could say to her, that I was at a positive attitude, that I would be prepared to help her die if finally there was a moment where she would find life unacceptable anymore. And being a professional, I thought I could ask her, what, can you tell me what will be the moment that you want to die? And she could say, you know, I've been looking after people all my life professionally. If I am completely bedridden, dependent of my partner. She was not married, but she had a friend living together. And if I'm dependent of caregivers, that's for me the, the, the moment I don't want to live on. So I visited her regularly. She visited my office as soon as much as she could. And gradually, I saw her getting into bed more and finally found her bedridden 24 hours have needing care of over everybody, depending on her partner. And after two weeks, I still didn't hear her say something. I expected her to say, Rob, we have reached this moment where I think this is enough. So I just friendly remembered her. I said, you know, we, I thought you had said something like being independent. She said, well, my suffering is not as bad as I thought it would be. So. Actually, uh, I would like to set a new limit. So we set a new limit. We agreed on a new moment where she would say, this is wrong. <laughs> to make a long story short, she shifted her limit four times. 
And every time I had to remind her of the fact that she passed along, uh, over her limit. And every time she said, well, it is not so bad as I thought it was, etc. Only the last time, that was the moment where she said, Rob, now is the end, now is enough. So we sat down, we talked about it, and the important lesson she learned me was that she could shift those limits, postpone actually the moment of the euthanasia, because she knew I was going to help her anyway in the end if she really wanted what she called the peace of mind. She could bear more suffering than she originally thought she could bear. So that has been an important lesson for me, which I have uh, used many times in the future. She died finally at 51 years of old age. I gave her euthanasia and she really, she said goodbye to her relatives. Everybody was there when she died and she died with a smile on her face because finally she received what she wanted. Okay, you have heard me talking about euthanasia. I know the word euthanasia in many countries, and I think also in New Zealand, has some different ideas, gives some different decisions. It is important for you to realize, if I talk today about euthanasia, I use what I call then, what I mean is this Dutch definition. Euthanasia, when I speak about it in the Netherlands, it is a deliberate, so action, it, it is a deliberate termination of life by someone else, but on the explicit request of the person who is going to die. What does it mean? Euthanasia is not terminal or palliative sedation or dying because of overdosing uh, pain treatments or any other thing. It is not non-voluntary termination of life. We will come later to that. Doctors, not only the Netherlands, everywhere do terminate lives. You could call that mercy killing. They do terminate lives while there is not a specific request. So that's not euthanasia. For example, euthanasia is not the non-voluntary termination of life of little babies, newborn babies. We're accused that we shift our limits we started euthanasia for the terminal cancer patient, and now we are euthanizing babies. We do terminate lives, or we, pediatricians do terminate lives, but that is not euthanasia. This is not organized by our law. And important also is that euthanasia is not, has nothing to do with decisions to not treat, not resuscitate. These are medical decisions, and as a patient you can ask them. It's important. Next to euthanasia, we have in the Netherlands the physician-assisted suicide. We use the word suicide, it's also a difficult word in many countries, but we use the word suicide. And the definition is more or less like euthanasia. It is a deliberate termination of life, only in this case the patient takes the medication, him or herself, but it is given on the prescription of the doctor, the doctor will be there, will give it, the, the, the medication, and the doctor will be attending the moment you're taking it and be there uh, until the patient dies. That's his responsibility. So that's the difference. For the rest, I will try to use medical aid in dying because that is a more general term, but there can be all things behind it. If I say euthanasia, it is the Dutch definition. Why did it happen in the Netherlands? It's always a question I get. Um, you know, we, we say we are the first country in the world to have a euthanasia law, to have a legalized possibility. To be honest, the Northern Territory of Australia was the first, well, not a country, but a region where euthanasia was legalized. But then the federal government took the law away after half a year, uh, so the doctor was no longer able to perform the euthanasia. So in a way, we were the first country as a total who accepted the law and uh, that's why. Why the culture? The why? Because we have a culture in the Netherlands and people here, I've met some of you who speak, uh, speak Dutch, who have been born there. Dutch culture is a culture where I sometimes say a problem, and if you talk about euthanasia that's a serious problem to talk about, 
a problem is not a problem as long as you can talk about it. And Dutch people always talk about everything, also about problems. And next thing what we do when we talk, we try to, what I say, we try to canalize the discussion. We have problems with the water, we build dikes to guide the water to the sea. We have a problem with euthanasia, we make rules, we try to regulate it in a good order, in a good direction. That's a kind of cultural thing. One of the reasons why you can not take our law, copy it and bring it here and say this is a good law. It's a good law for the Netherlands, maybe not for you or any other country. The second issue is the healthcare system. We are, we have still although in my opinion it is getting worse a little bit, but we have still a primary healthcare oriented system, which means that every patient, every Dutchman is on the list of a family doctor, and every family doctor has his or her own list, and he thinks they are his or her patients, they belong to each other. And they used to be long-standing relationships between families and the, and the general practitioner, that is why we call them family doctor, family medicine. We are, so the doctor knows a lot about uh, the patient, about the background, about the family, what's going on, why they choose it. It's important. Primary healthcare physician. The judicial system, I can just simply say, I can go into it for very much. In the Netherlands, the prosecutor is allowed to decide not to prosecute, although he knows a crime has been committed. It sounds strange, but if the crime is committed according to the criminal code, and the a court case would not be in the interest of the public, of the society, the prosecutor may say in the Netherlands, I'm not going to prosecute you. This has been important because on that basis, we were able in the Netherlands as doctors to sort of practice with euthanasia before it was a law. Because we knew when we kept to certain criteria, we would not be prosecuted. A major player in the Netherlands has been, and I think that's a big disadvantage of many countries in the world, so it's in your country, that our medical association, the Royal Dutch Medical Association, from the start has been supportive of a law for euthanasia. So the doctors have been supporting as organization. Yes, of course, there were doctors who were against it. But the organization has said, as long as we know it is happening, our colleagues are doing something, let's make a protocol for it. And let's see that it is done properly. I think the New Zealand doctors organization, I'm going to talk to them, or at least to a representative of them next week in Wellington, they are opposed because the World Medical Association says euthanasia is an unethical act for a doctor to perform. Another part of the history, you see four names. I will explain mainly the first one, Postma. Postma was a family doctor in a small village up in the north of the Netherlands. Actually, the whole village were in the practice of Dr. Postma and her husband. Her mother lived there, so she was also a patient of Dr. Posma. And her mother got ill, got physical problems, a little mental problems, and she had to be taken to a nursing home. And her mother said to daughter Trus, Trus, listen, if it really gets worse, you're going to help me. You do something to me. And Trus said, as many doctors in that time did, yes, of course, I do something. I will help you. And she did, finally. And she did give an overdose of some sort, and her mother died. She did something which I said again, many doctors did, and still do, over, everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world I know there will be patients who are at the end of their life, suffering unbearably, go to the doctor and say, doctor, please do something, this is no life. And I assure you, all over the world, doctors do something. She was uh, found out, went to court, and it was a big court case, and we had a lot of media publicity in the Netherlands at that moment. The villagers, seeing their doctor being prosecuted for murder, 
because that was it in legal terms, said, our doctor is not a murderer. We have a very good doctor and we want her to be free. And they started to get signatures and, the, and our right to die society started in 73 as a consequence of this action. She was prosecuted, she was uh, convicted by the judge because the court said, you have trespassed the law, you're not allowed to terminate someone's life. So she was convicted, uh, but the judge said, because she had followed all kinds of uh, very good criteria, she convicted Dr. Posma to one week on probation. <laughs> and the judge has been heard afterward to have said, if I am as your mother was, I hope you are my doctor. That was Dr. Posma. He wrote down the criteria why he gave such a light sentence, symbolical sentence. And all of us, the medical professional, knew from then on, if we follow those criteria, that we might have a chance, if we are found out, that we will not be sentenced as well. The Doctors' Association took them on board and say, all right, this is what we have to sort of make a protocol from. And a number of doctors later have been brave enough, Dr. Schoonheim, Dr. Chabot, to say to the authorities, I did it. And go to court and tell me what I did wrong. And they were also in the whole legal procedure. They went up to the Supreme Court, which has been very important because a Supreme Court decision is a sort of law. And finally, in the end, the Supreme Court decisions were codified by the lawmakers into a law. I skip Dr. Sutorius because that is too complicated for a short time there. A second consequence of our history, in 1984, this doctor went to the Supreme Court and everybody said, OK, it's happening. And we wanted again, we went to the government and said, we want a law like you are doing at this moment or Enter Life Choices is doing. And since we have in the Netherlands a, always a coalition government, we don't have a two-party system, we have always coalitions. And since very long time, the Christian Democrats always have been in power, always have been in the coalition. And the Christian Democrats are known not to be in favor of legalizing euthanasia. So they found a way around, maybe also a typical Dutch way. They asked a couple of experts and said, you go sit down and you make us a report on what is happening. And usually when a government makes a commission, they expect it will take years before they come with results. This commission worked good. First of all, they made this definition I used. And from then on, we always in the Netherlands used that word euthanasia and that definition. The second thing is what they did, they made a survey. They asked scientists to make a very good statistical sound survey. This was a large survey held in the 1990. And it was sent to, uh, I think, about 2,000 doctors. And this survey, questionnaire was joined with a letter in which both the prosecutor and the medical association said to the doctor, if you give information about your last, uh, your act, what you have been doing in end of life, you will never be prosecuted on the basis of the information you provide in this survey. And that was the reason why we got a response of 80%. So 80% of the doctors responded to, the, to it. Which means that from then on, because the survey has been repeated more or less every five years since then, we know quite well what doctors do. We know what they do in euthanasia. We also know what they do in termination of life, not on request or any other decisions. And of course, we had the review committees in 1998, just before the law were installed. We said, OK, if you do it, accepted by the Supreme Court, but please report your case to the review committees. And finally, in 1999, Els Borst, the Minister of Health, came into Parliament with a bill. So it was not a private member's bill, it was the government. And she used a political loophole, because in that period, the Christian Democrats were not in the government. So there was not a majority where the Christian Democrats were need needed. 
So they used that loophole to legalize our euthanasia. And the Christian Democrats have said, since that has been a democratic decision, we will not take that decision away as soon as we are in power. So we are, we are know about that. Okay. What is a typical thing of our law? One of the major things you must realize is that euthanasia in our country is still in the criminal code. Physician-assisted suicide is still in the criminal code. This is a strange construction, maybe, but it prevents, for example, that nurses who can provide euthanasia, you know my definition, deliberate termination of life by someone else. Everybody can apply euthanasia according to the definition. But we added an article to our law, our criminal code, and we said, euthanasia is still a crime, but when that someone else is a doctor, and when the doctor complies with the criteria, follow the criteria, then the doctor will not be prosecuted, will stay outside the whole legal procedure, will not having, has, have committed a crime. For fishing assisted suicide, that's the same. If a doctor has done it, he follows the criteria, he will not be prosecuted, not be punishable. What are those criteria? I already said euthanasia is on request. If there's no request, no euthanasia. But in the law, it states that that request must be voluntary, which means that the patient, him or herself, must ask it. And must ask it from the doctor. And that request also must be well considered. And well considered in both sides. I sometimes say, if you come to my office this morning and you ask for euthanasia, you can't get it this afternoon. It is something we have to talk about and more than once for a longer time. The voluntarity of the request is sometimes difficult to, to see. How do we see as doctors that there is not a family member or someone behind the patient saying, well, is it not time for you to ask for euthanasia? It is something because I am pretty sure that no doctor in the Netherlands actually enjoys doing euthanasia. He doesn't like to do it. And if I talk for me personally, I know that when I got the request, my first reaction was, oh no, I, I don't do it to have it again. So I try to find alternatives. I, I say to the patient, well, have you th well thought about it? And certainly if there would be something behind the question, something like a family, as a family doctor, I know the patient, I know the family. They will certain, certainly be seeing that I would not comply with the request and I have the right not to comply. The second important criterion is that there must be unbearable and hopeless suffering. It's an important criterion and it's an important difference with many laws or bills around the world. You see, there's nothing which says you have to be terminally ill. No, we say if you are suffering, and if you're suffering and unbearably and hopeless, that is the criterion to say yes to a request. And I made the word end red, because I think it's the most important word in this law. Why? Suffering is unbearable. The only one who can say that suffering is unbearable is the patient. Nobody else can say that suffering, you are unbearably suffering or you are unbearably suffering. So it is important for the person who is asking for euthanasia to convince the doctor that he or she finds his or her suffering unbearable. The doctor tries to find solutions and say, well, you see, if I treat this, your suffering will no longer be unbearable, it might be bearable. And so he'll try to find alternatives in conversation with the patient. And when finally the doctor has no possible treatments or things to go on, the doctor together with the patient will decide, and that's why the word end is so important, the doctor and the patient together will say, this patient with this condition at this moment is complying with the law. So there the law is a kind of framework in which the doctor and the patient can make a decision. 
Next to these two important criteria, there are some what I would call procedural criteria. Once the doctor has decided there's a compliance with the law, the criteria, he has to consult a second independent doctor. The doctor must really be independent. The doctor will not be your colleague from your practice or your neighbor or a family member. It will not be a doctor who has been involved in the treatment of the patient. So it is an independent doctor. And for that reason, we have found in the Netherlands, we specialize at this moment, uh, mainly family doctors, but they're also specialists, to be that second independent doctor. That is the scheme which is called SCAN. S is for support, C for consultation, for doctors with euthanasia in the Netherlands. That is a scheme. We have some 700 independent doctors. They are really independent. They get a phone call. They are on call by phone, so you just get someone from the list. And of course, the law says that it must be done in good medical practice. You don't do something like uh, giving high doses of morphine, which is not considered to be a good euthanasia practice. The law also states that if you are no longer able to request euthanasia, you're not longer competent to ask for it, then there, and if there is an advanced directive, which means if you have written down in such and such a situation, when I can no longer communicate, I want this and this and that. That advanced directive has in the Netherlands a legal status. It might and is allowed to replace the oral request. And you know, it is only euthanasia if there is a request. Doctors like to have an oral request. But if it is no longer possible, the advanced directive is uh, the same. Especially important with dementia. We will come to that later, I hope. And the regional review committees have been installed, five regionals, and they get in all the reports because it is obligatory for doctors to report their euthanasia. So you can say if the doctor does not report to the committee, he is actually uh, committing a crime because he's not complying with uh, the law. What we do is we bring the patient in a deep sleep very deep sleep indeed, and then give a muscle relaxant by which the heart and the breathing will stop and the patient will die rather soon. This is just a very active method to terminate the life. Where with physician-assisted suicide, the doctor prescribes and brings to the patient also a barbiturate, a heavy sleeping drug in an overdose, and the patient drinks that himself, it will be taking a little longer. I've talked about the advanced directives. I think I will just skip that because of the time. I may only say this. One of the special ones in the Netherlands, because we have a law, is the euthanasia declaration. Your advanced directives do more than talk about euthanasia. They talk about non-treatment and things like that. They, you write down in the document the, you are giving out end-of-life choices what you want to be done when you are terminally ill or no longer capable to say aloud. Our euthanasia declaration only concerns euthanasia decisions. It is only important to have that available when you are no longer able to talk, to, com to communicate with your doctor. We say that the validity, I don't know whether it's good English word, but the validity, you can, it is valid every time, unless you tore it. But it is important to bring that document to your doctor and to talk with your doctor about what's in it. So to not only put it in the file, but you just talk about it. And not only talk about it now, but talk about it regularly after that. Discuss it and see what your doctor thinks. And if you have changing views, you adapt your uh, last, uh, your um, euthanasia declaration and resign it regularly. That's not legally obliged, but it is better to do it. We will come later to that, how important it might be. Currently, the law in the Netherlands is working. That's what I can say. If you look at the figures, we get figures from the survey, 2013 was the last one, 
and we get annual reports from the review committees. So we know how much it happens, we know what doctors do. What we now see is that actually 80-85% of all euthanasia cases are with terminal cancer. It's considered in the Netherlands as practically normal medical behavior. Mind you, for those who ask for it, there are much more terminally cancer patients who do not ask for euthanasia, just go on being treated in whatever treatment is necessary. The scan system is adopted almost always, so we have a rather good guarantee that the second independent doctor really is independent and expertise. There is a live and clinic. I just mention it because some of you might have heard about it. This is not a clinic. It is an organization who employs teams of a doctor and a nurse who together can uh, make a decision on someone who asks for euthanasia and is refused by his own doctor. And in many cases, 50% of their requests, they turn down as well. And of those requests which are complied with, they try to involve their own family doctors in 50% of the cases, which is a kind of educational scene. The second big issue in this has been the status of palliative care. They have sometimes said that we made a law because we don't have palliative care. We didn't have it as a specialized entity. We didn't have specialist trained, uh, specialist palliative care specialists. We had some hospices, but actually, and certainly nowadays still, palliative care is completely integrated in our healthcare system. So family doctors follow courses in palliative care. Palliative care is integrated in the hospital system. And yes, we have so, some hospices, and certainly we have doctors who do more with palliative care than others. And the important to realize is that nowadays, the Netherlands is in the top five of best, Europe, uh, of best palliative care systems in Europe. So it is important to realize it is also the same minister who brought the bill to parliament on euthanasia, who provided the palliative care system with the money to develop properly. We still have problems. Psychiatry is one, dementia is one, and completed life is one, but I leave it for today. I think even I skip the psychiatry and go to dementia, because I think that may be of your biggest interest. One of the big problems of dementia is that nobody knows when it starts. I sometimes I say at this kind of presentations, I may have dementia yet at this moment. I don't know. My wife still thinks that I don't forget too many things, so I think I'm still healthy and not demented. The second problem is that dementia, the, if you, once it is diagnosed, once you have got it, it is absolutely certain a disease which is, will in the end kill you. So it will go down. It will not go down in a straight line. It will go up and down. And many of you know, demented patients know that one day a dementia patient knows the daughter is visiting and say, how nice, I see you. And next day the patient will say, oh, nice of you lady that you visit me and that I'm here. And next day she will recognize the daughter again. So that is a kind of, that is the difficulty. For the understanding of what I'm going to say now, I changed the wobbly line into a straight line, because that is what actually is happening. You go down the path towards your death. And I added some other things to make it complicated, I hope. Can you, you can see it from there, or maybe otherwise we have to talk about later, or I think the slides are available on internet, or will be on available, so it will come there. Important is that you know when you have dementia, the moment it is diagnosed, not earlier. So it depends on you how early you go with your forgetting things to a doctor before you know if it is there. And once you know it, it will go down until the moment which is here, which I call 12 o'clock, where you lose competence. So you no longer are able to communicate uh, with the doctor, because the doctor will not know what you mean if you say yes or no. That is what I call 12 o'clock. 
our confection in the Netherlands is, if you make an advanced directive saying that if you are demented and you are really no longer able to live the life you want, and you talk about that regularly with your doctor about, then you may have the situation where your doctor knows what your opinion is. You have been discussing it many times that the, uh, euthanasia may be applied one minute before 12 because they are still a little competent. The doctor still can ask, is this really what you want? And apply the euthanasia. My conviction is that if you do not have these directives in place, you have not discussed them with your doctor, what happens is that people after the diagnosis, knowing that they are now going on the path down, will either commit suicide or will ask the doctor in a much earlier stage, saying we are suffering and they might even die 11 o'clock or half past, before, half past 11. So with an advanced directive, with a law, we are able to provide euthanasia for people at 1 minute to 12. We said we come. I will now finish with what is called misconceptions. You could always say uh, what people say who are opposed to it, say which is wrong about our law, which happens in the Netherlands. The first one I also rephrase as, if you are 65 and older, please do not come to the Netherlands, because when you're ill and get into a hospital, you will be killed by a doctor. <laughs> because we need a bed, or because it is costing too much. That is utterly nonsense. You can say it more decent and say, old and incapacitated people in the Netherlands are afraid of going to hosp hospitals and nursing homes. There even have been stories that the Dutch people have cards in their pockets say, I want to live. <laughs> I think I can prove that the facts show different. And I use the numbers from one of the latest review committee annual reports. There were, in that year, 2013, we had about 4,500 cases of euthanasia reported. And of those, 3,800 died at home. So people do not have euthanasia in hospitals or in nursing homes. I can even say that many times people being treated in hospitals, being terminal, are sent home because they want to die at home. So there is certainly no danger for you to come to the Netherlands. Please do. I only say make it June, July, because then you have the same weather I, as I have now here. Another misconception is I've treated already. People saying, if you have optimal palliative care, you do not need euthanasia, because palliative care can deal with everything around the end of life. I am pretty sure they cannot. And I know many palliative care doctors in the Netherlands who agree with me. And they agree with us, finally, we had it as a large discussion, but finally agreed that palliative care not always makes euthanasia redundant. But I have also a fact to prove. When we ask patients, why do you want euthanasia? We see that pain, a phys the first physical symptom, which is uh, apparently well treated or treatable by, by palliative care doctors, is on the sixth place. The first ones are all about loss of meaning in life, deteriorating of life, having bad quality of life, uh, total weakness, prevention of deterioration, dependence, loss of autonomy, loss of control, that sort of things. And yes, of course, talking with those patients and having palliative care in place can take away a little of that, but not all of it. They can treat pain, they can be suffocation, which you will certainly need for people who ask it. There are many people who do not ask. People who ask it can have euthanasia, although it is the best palliative care in the world. Euthanasia mercy killing, I said already, we have prov proved by the research that doctors do mercy kill, do terminate lives uh, without there being a request because they consider that life 
for that person, knowing that person, that certainly if he would have been able to communicate, he certainly would have said something like that. The big difference between the two is that euthanasia is the deliberate termination of life by someone else on the explicit request. If there is no request, there is no euthanasia. I cannot stress that enough. Where, while if we're talking about mercy killing, it's also deliberate termination. Yes, maybe of meaningless life. And it is an action done out of compassion. Yes, sure. But it is not on request, so it is not euthanasia. And literally uh, a crime because you have trespassed the law. Once euthanasia is tolerated, people say, once you give the doctor one finger, he will take the whole hand. Once you give him, allow him to terminate the life on request in terminal cancer case, the next thing which he will do, he will use it as much as he can. I can tell you that in research we have found that doctors every year can bear about three or four times a euthanasia case. The skin doctors, who are not even giving euthanasia, only reviewing euthanasia, do it about 10 times a year. And that's a sort of maximum. They cannot bear the emotional burden from that. And another proof is, and I use there one of our uh, surveys, in 1990, we had a situation where 1,000 patients were killed by a doctor or terminated their lives by a doctor where there was not a request. It has been known now worldwide as the thousand of Remelink, Remelink being the chairperson of the commission. What we see was at that moment it was 0.8% of all death cases in the Netherlands. What we see after the law, 2001, we already start to drop, and after it, we see that at this moment, it's only 0.2% of all death cases where the doctor terminates the life without request. So if the slippery slope argument would be true, this percentage would be 1.2 and not 0.2. So this will certainly not happen uh, in the Netherlands. I have tried to make a scheme, which is very difficult to read, to compare the Dutch and the New Zealand Marion Street Bill. There's a lot to be said about that. In general, I think the Marion Street Bill is good. It's a good uh, point to get approved in the first reading and to go to the select committee and be discussed there. And I certainly hope one of those days, months, or maybe next year, this will get through the first reading. And in the select committee, there will be time to adapt the bill proposed, which are drafts in the proposal. One of the things I think is a major difference is that we in the Netherlands talk about suffering unbearably and hopelessly as a criterion. In many laws, also in your bill, it is about terminally ill and dying within 12 months. It looks sensible, but if you look behind it and you discuss it, it will it can give uh, problematic things. Generally, many bills in the world try to build in as many safeguards as they can. It looks sensible, but it will provide more problems, is my experience, and less problems, and certainly in the whole legalization process. I think I will leave the situation in the world, and as a Dutchman, a teacher, I would like to end with three lessons. The first one is, medical aid in dying should, in my opinion, be considered as an act to terminate suffering, and not as an act to terminate life. We terminate the life because that is the only possibility we have as a doctor to terminate the unbearable suffering. The second lesson is, I told you about my Mrs. B. If you have medical aid in dying available, it most often prolongs life, and not only prolongs life, but prolongs quality of life, rather than that it shortens it. And the last lesson, in my opinion, is that over 35 years of Dutch tolerated, till 2002, and legalized euthanasia, or medical aid in dying, 
it, the practice of it shows no sign of a slippery slope. And that is proven by scientific research worldwide. I thank you for your attention. And we have Q&A after the break. <laughs>